Hi guys, welcome to Little Wicket Railway, I'm Rob and in this video we're going to see what effect curves have on trains going up gradients. Recently I did an experiment to see how well 23 models coped with gradients ranging from 1-4%. to The reason for doing the test was because I want a helix on my new layout to take trains from the lower staging level to the upper scenic level and I was a bit worried that some of the locos wouldn't make it up the slope. But the test showed that as long as the gradients were around 1 or 2%, generally I should be okay and I was pretty relieved. Quite a few people pointed out in the comments that my test was done on a straight piece of track but a helix is curved and curves can make going up gradients a lot harder. And this made me feel a bit nervous again. So to see how much difference introducing a curve makes I've built this test helix. The curve is fourth radius which gives a diameter 1.14 meters or just under four feet. I've designed and 3D printed these supports and if my calculations are correct they should give a constant 2% gradient. In reality the the floor isn't perfectly level in here and despite my best efforts to level things up with weights and the shims, the gradient percentage varies a bit either side of 2% but it should be good enough. The idea is that I can get the same locos that I used in the previous straight gradient test and put them on the helix. Then we can compare the results and see how much difference the curve makes. My straight test track wasn't very long so I had to use weighted wagons to simulate coaches but there's a lot more track on the helix so I can use full rates of coaches. So it's not a like for like test but using actual coaches is far more realistic. I'll be running each loco up the helix, stopping them somewhere near the top and checking they can manage a standing start because getting up a gradient with a run up and some momentum is one thing but stopping and starting again is far harder. Like before I've split the video into chapters for each loco so you can jump around and those are all listed out in the video description and if you just want to jump to the end and see the results go ahead. Right let's get some trains running up this helix. Well work through the locos in the same order as last time starting with the Backman Thomas the Tank Engine. He's a super light loco and previously he couldn't get any Mark 1's up a 2% gradient so I didn't even bother trying the Hornby coaches with him, I went straight for Annie and Claribel that came with him in the set. These coaches are pretty light and they're very free running so Thomas didn't have any issues getting these up the helix. To give him a bit of a test I added a couple of trucks and a brake van from the 1985 Hornby Thomas set and that was pretty much the limit for him. So the results for Thomas are that he couldn't manage a Mark 1 coach up a 2% gradient on the straight and he can't do it on a curve either, but he can pull Annie and Clarabelle so that's all that matters. Next up is the Hornby Rustin 48DS. I really like these models, Hornby did very well with these, they're good runners and the detail is lovely. In the previous straight line test it didn't do well on a 2% gradient and around the helix it could only manage a single coach, which is actually quite impressive given how small and light this model is. The lack of pulling power on a gradient doesn't bother me, this chap is likely to live in a flat yard doing some shunting work. It's unlikely that I'll ever need him to go up and down the helix. So it's the same result for the 48DS on the straight and the curved, just the single Mark 1 coach. Moving on to the classic Hornby 040 Smokey Joe. This guy is all about speed rather than pulling power and in the straight line test at 2% I recorded him as being able to pull the equivalent of three coaches, which he was able to do again on the Helix. I decided to add on another coach to take it up to 4. There was a fair bit of wheel slip happening as he got going again on the slope but surprisingly Smokey Joe was able to get them to the top. This suggests that maybe my weighted wagons in the original test weren't a very good approximation of coaches and it's actually slightly easier with the actual coach models. So the results were three coaches on the straight and four coaches on the curved helix. An odd result but this was the only model which pulled more on the curves than it did on the straights. Maybe I was just a bit harsh on him in the last test. Next up is the Hornby Peckett, another Hornby success story I think, nicely detailed, very reliable and mighty for such a small locomotive. I had it pulling four coaches up the straight 2% gradient, which it seemed like it might be able to do again on the Helix, until I tried to get it to do a standing start. Unfortunately it just couldn't get going again. After removing a coach, taking it down to three in total, the model had absolutely no problems. So this is the first time in the test where it looks like introducing a curve seems to have had an impact. So final results were three coaches on the curve versus four on the straight. Like the Rustin though, I think it's probably best I keep the Peckett on level ground at shunting wagons. On to the first 060 with the Hornby Railroad Jinty. Not the most detailed model but I've got a soft spot for it because it was one of the first I bought and I've used it to experiment on by adding a flickering firebox and a TTS sound decoder. So I'll turn off the music so you can hear it chuff. In the previous test it pulled the equivalent of six coaches up the straight. So that's what I started with on the Helix and although it did get to the top you can hear that it's not having the easiest time.
I removed one coach, taking the rake down to five and that did the trick. Again, it seems like the curve has had an impact here. Results were six on the straight and five on the curve. I'm pretty satisfied with that. I will probably set him up with a three or four coach Suburban service and he'll have no problems with that. Next up is another one of my favourites, the Backman Web Coal Tank, but on the day of filming this model was behaving really badly. I'm not sure if it was dirty wheels or misaligned pickups, but it did not want to run smoothly and I didn't have time to fully investigate. When I did manage to get it running though, it pulled five coaches, which is exactly the same as it did on the previous straight line test, and pulling away from a standing start didn't seem to be an issue. So the results were five coaches on both. I haven't run this model a huge amount, but it's never played up before. If it does prove to be a bit electrically unreliable, I might fit a stay alive. On to the Backman LMS-1P. This is another sound fitted loco, so I'll mute the music so you can have a listen. Although I think the speaker on this is pretty small and might not be the best quality because the model sounds quite tinny. Anyway, it's a similar weight to the previous Web Coal Tank, but it only managed three coaches in the previous test on the 2% straight ramp. And I think that was down to their only being four driving wheels on this model. I tried it with three again on the Helix, but it couldn't get to the top. So I had to reduce that to two. Slightly disappointing, but I suppose it's only a 1P power classification, so even the full size version isn't very powerful. So the results are three coaches on the straight, but only two on the curves. It looks like this will be limited to a short goods train or a two coach branch line service. Then it was time for the Oxford Rail Dean Goods, which is actually quite a small loco, but it's our first with the tender. This managed four coaches on the straight, but this proved to be too much for it on the Helix. The fourth coach had barely made it onto the gradient before the loco came to a standstill. Reducing the rate to three coaches allowed it to climb to the top. So these aren't very powerful models, but in a way that reflects the prototypes. They were all designed and built in the 19th century, and it wouldn't have been a very powerful locomotive. As a side note, this model got quite a bit of abuse on the forums because apparently it has a lot of inaccuracies and isn't considered a very good likeness of a Dean Goods. But I'm actually not too bothered. It's a good looking loco in my opinion, and I liked it so much that I recently picked up a version in the war department livery. Results were four coaches on the straight and three on the curved. That roughly equates to nine wagons though, which is okay for a short goods train. Onto the Hornby Railroad 4P Compound, a model that I found to be pretty weak in the past, especially when going uphill. It only managed three coaches up the 2% gradient in the previous test. I started it off with three on the Helix and it was okay with a run up, but failed when asked to do a standing start, which was disappointing. After removing a coach, it was able to stop and pull away on the Helix though. So not great results for this model, but I thought it might struggle based on past experience. It's got traction tires and I've even added some weights to try and get it to pull a bit more, but I don't think I'm gonna get much more out of this no matter what I do. So sadly, it might not be right for the new layout. Up next is the Hornby Class 395 Javelin, and this is the version from the mainline range rather than the version that comes in the train set. Rather than test it with the Mark 1 coaches, I've used the coaches that came in the train pack and the extra coach pack to make up the full six car set because this is the only way I will be running it. I really love the look of this model, but I have to say that the build quality isn't great. Plastic pantographs, badly glued coach connections and poorly fitted coupling mechanisms are just a few of the things I've noted. But my main concern was that despite the size of the driving vehicle, the motor is tiny. Only a single bogey is driven and I don't think there's any flywheel. Plus, we've got traction tires, which usually means that there's a lack of grip. However, it seems like my concerns weren't really justified as it handled the Helix without issue. So just like in the straight line test, it gets a pass on the Helix. In the future, I think I might explore if there's a way to improve the performance and look of this model. Another sound fitted loco now, so I'll drop the music and you can have a listen to the Backman 94XX. This pulled a whopping nine coaches up the straight gradient, which is really impressive for a small pannier tank. And I was interested to see what impact the curves would have on such a long rake of coaches. It couldn't manage the nine on the Helix, but I only had to take a single coach off and reduce the rake to eight for it to make it up. That is an incredible performance given its size and I've got no concerns about it on the future layout. It helps that it weighs the best part of 300 grams and has six driving wheels. A lovely little model and it also has a flickering firebox which is a nice extra feature. Next up is the Daypole GWR Large Prairie. This is the first loco tested that weighs over 300 grams and that extra weight obviously makes a difference as it pulled the equivalent of 11 coaches in the previous test. 
I was really impressed with the haulage capacity and was expecting big things from it again in this test. But this is one loco where there appeared to be a huge difference between how it performed on the straight and how much it could pull up the helix. With 11 coaches on the gradient, it couldn't keep going, so I tried it again with 10, but it still wasn't happening. Then 9 coaches, but the model still struggled. It wasn't until I got down to 8 coaches that the large prairie was able to complete the helix, but even then I felt like it was struggling. Clearly, the extra coach axles and the curves were having a huge impact, with almost a 30% reduction in performance compared with going up a straight gradient. I only plan on running this model with 6 coaches, and thankfully it was able to handle that comfortably. So the results for the Daypole GWR Large Prairie were 11 on the straight, but a maximum of 8 on the Helix. Moving on to the Hornby Lodestar, in the previous test this 460 tender engine pulled the equivalent of 8 coaches up the straight 2% gradient, but there was a huge drop off in performance when the gradient was increased to 3% and it could only pull 2 coaches. When it was put on the Helix, we also see this huge drop off in performance. With 8 coaches it came to a standstill shortly after the 8th coach was pulled onto the slope. It could climb the Helix with 6 coaches but couldn't manage the standing start without a ton of wheel slip and never really got going. Only when we got down to 5 coaches was the standing start possible. So the results are 8 coaches on the straight but only 5 on the Helix. Another big reduction in performance caused by those curves. Moving away from steam to the Class 73 Electro Diesel from Hornby. This pulled the equivalent of 11 coaches on the straight gradient test and just about managed 11 again. I held my breath when doing the standing start, but it did get going. 11 coaches has to be the absolute maximum here and I don't think it would build up any real speed with a rake of that size. Taking a couple of coaches off would be ideal and I expect it would run very well like that, but I've been generous in the results and said it matched its performance on the straight with 11 coaches for both. This next one is straightforward, it's the Hellion GWR rail car. I'm only going to run it on its own, so no coaches to test it with, but it had absolutely no problems flying up the helix. It's got sound, so have a listen. So that's a big green tick for the rail car on the Helix. Next up is the Hornby LNER A4 named Gagani from the Queen of Scots train pack. This loco looks big and powerful, but it's actually quite weak. It's lightweight for its size and it feels very plasticky. Overall, it's a bit of a disappointing model. It pulled the equivalent of 6 coaches up the straight gradient, which wasn't very many, so I was really worried that having seen how some of the other Steam Locos struggled, that that could be reduced to maybe 4, which really wouldn't be acceptable. But thankfully, it was also able to haul 6 coaches up the Helix, still a pathetic performance for what's meant to be a powerful Loco, but I suppose it'll just about do. Final result, 6 coaches on both. Moving on to the Hornby 9F, this isn't the newly tooled version which I hear is very good but the older tooling. The full sized versions of these were very powerful engines and this model did manage to pull the maximum load in the previous test of 11 coaches. Unfortunately it wasn't able to repeat that on the Helix. As we've seen with some of the other steam models on the Helix, they seem to lose about 30% of their pulling power. I had to reduce the rake to 8 coaches before the 9F could make it up and perform a standing start. Slightly disappointing, but that's still around 20 wagons, so a good length freight train. Final results, 11 coaches on the straight, 8 on the helix. Another large steam loco next, the Hornby Princess Coronation in the red streamlining. Despite looking like quite a large powerful locomotive, this model gave a slightly disappointing performance on the straight, only managing 9 coaches and on the helix that was further reduced to 7. With 9 coaches attached it did move but it was wheel slipping the entire time. Generally this model feels very plasticky and given its size it doesn't really weigh that much so maybe adding a bit of weight could help. Final results were 9 on the straight and 7 on the helix. And our third Hornby large steam loco in a row now with Tornado. This managed to get 11 coaches up the straight gradient but the helix seemed to have a large impact on this loco. I had to reduce the rake to 7 coaches for it to climb the helix but there was still too much wheel slip when I tried a standing start. It was only when I reduced the rake to 6 coaches that it could pull away and accelerate whilst on the curved 2% gradient. 
This is the biggest difference that I saw with any of the locomotives tested and I can't really explain why Tornado seems to be more impacted than the other models, but a 45% reduction in pulling power was pretty shocking. So the results were 11 coaches on the straight but only 6 on the helix. On to the Hornby GWR Class 43s which I fitted with sound decoders. Just to be clear, these are the detailed main range HSTs rather than the version from the train set. The power car contains a lot of metal and weighs in at over half a kilogram. In the previous test this had no problems pulling the heaviest weight I had available up the slope. On the Helix I set it up as a 6 car castle set with the 4 Mark III coaches because this is how I'll be running it on the layout and it had absolutely no issues going up the slope or pulling away from a standing start. I really like these models and the Mark III's are very free running which is always helpful when they're being pulled up a slope. Another model where adding in the curves made no difference was the Backman Class 101 DMU which will only ever be run as a two car set and it had no issues at all with the Helix. Fantastic model, I really like it and it's just fun to drive. On to the Hornby Class 67 in the Belmont British Pullman livery. It easily coped with the weight of 11 coaches on the straight test and it managed to do the same on the Helix, but it definitely took a lot longer to get going and there was visibly more effort required from the motor. So results were 11 coaches in both tests, but I probably wouldn't run it with that much of a load very often to avoid damaging the motor, and Pullman coaches with table lights are likely to have more drag, so maybe a reduced number if you're using those. Finally, the Hatton's original Class 66, which is the heaviest loco at 751 grams. But every time I get it out of the box, it tries to make itself a little bit lighter as bits drop off. Don't get me wrong, it's a lovely model. Extremely detailed, but just very fragile. The pulling power of this model is superb and it easily dragged the weight of 11 coaches up the straight gradient in the previous test and it didn't disappoint on the helix, getting all 11 to the top. So a super powerful locomotive that just needs to be handled with a bit of care. So the final results were 11 coaches in the previous test and also 11 coaches on the helix. So that's all the tests complete and the full results are on the screen. Some interesting results in there. It seems like the steam locos were most impacted with a reduction of 20 to 30% in pulling power. Whereas the diesels and electric locos whilst I'm sure they were also feeling the increased resistance, had sufficient haulage capacity to overcome the extra drag caused by the curves so the impact wasn't as noticeable. My Helix was made with fourth radius curves because that's what I'll be using on my layout. I did wonder what impact using tighter third or second radius curves would have and I thought about giving it a go but I really don't have time at the moment to do any more testing. Maybe it can be a fun experiment for after I've built the layout but I'm pretty satisfied now that I can construct my Helix and run trains how I planned without too many issues so it's time to carry on with the layout. So there we are, hopefully you found that useful. If you did, then please give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. A big thank you to the channel's YouTube members and patrons whose names are on the screen now. You guys make all this possible and I'm really grateful for your support. That's it for this video, thanks for watching and I'll hopefully see you again soon.